Let's pray briefly. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Chris Wilson is an entrepreneur right here in Baltimore, relatively young man. He wrote a book called Master Plan. It was published just a few years ago. It's a very contemporary person in Baltimore City today. What makes Chris's story so incredible is the backstory, where he came from and what he had to struggle through to get to where he was, is today. He grew up in Washington, D.C. in a pretty rough neighborhood. He was a young black kid growing up, as too many young black kids do in our inner cities today. There was crime in his neighborhood, there were drugs, there were violence. And he became under the influence of those things. He started to get into that life. Not only was he faced with all of that on the outside and all of those traumatic influences happening then, but he had trauma experienced in his home life as well. He was raised by a very loving single mother, uh, but she married a police officer when he was a young boy who ended up being abusive to Chris and to his mother. And they felt trapped because people wouldn't believe them. Uh, this was a police officer they were trying to report. Uh, and so Chris just had challenges on the outside and on the inside. He, des he describes his young life as being in a combat zone. He did have loving influences, even though he was moving into this life of crime. He describes his mother as instilling deeply within him the value and the knowledge that he was a good person. And he talks about his grandfather, who pulled him aside one day and told him, quite bluntly, Chris, I'm ashamed of you. And he said, why are you ashamed of me? And he said, because you have so much potential. You could be so much, and you're letting all of these in other people outside influence you and corrupt you into doing things that you are not being called to do. Despite his grandfather's warnings and his mother's love, Chris uh, did end up killing somebody at age 17. He was sentenced to life in prison for first-degree murder. He talks about going to prison as a young 17-year-old, about 120 pounds, um, he was tried as an adult, received this life sentence. He talks about being teleported to an alien world. In prison, he met all kinds of other folks who were also there for life, including a man who he saw one day writing computer code on a blank sheet of paper. And he said, what are you doing? And the guy said, I'm, I'm learning how to program computers, teaching myself. And Chris said, we're, we're all here for life. Why are you even bothering with that? And the man said, you know, they can imprison our bodies in this place, but they can't imprison our minds. That got him thinking, and he went back to his cell and meditated for a long time and ended up writing down his master plan. His master plan was basically a vision of what he wanted his life to be. He wanted to become an entrepreneur. He wanted to get his education to get his high school diploma, a college degree. He wanted to learn foreign languages. He wanted to start a business that would help people like him, people who had grown up in the same kinds of circumstances he did. He wanted to own a black convertible Corvette with really nice rims. And he put all this down on his master plan list. And what's truly astounding to me about this story is that even though he had life in prison, even though he had this vision of what his life could be, it started to influence how he was acting in the present. His vision of the future, however far off it may seem, started to influence who he was in the present. And so he started to learn to read and write. He taught himself to read and write. He got his college diploma in prison. He got an associate's degree in sociology in prison. He learned Spanish and Italian and started to study Mandarin. He read every book he could get his hands on, and he joined. A, he created a book club in prison, and he created a career counseling center in prison. Not because he thought that this was going to get him out, it's just that that vision of the future transformed who he was in the present. About 16 and a half years after he went into prison, he found himself before a judge who learned about everything that he'd been doing, and she let him out. 
she granted him parole. He got out, and I'm not exactly clear why he didn't get in touch with his mother immediately, but somehow she called him and didn't know he was out. So I'm a little fuzzy on that part of the story. But she reached out to him, and she found out he was out of jail, and she wanted to know if he had escaped. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, Mom, I didn't escape. Uh, they, they let me out on parole. And he said, I have this master plan now. I have this plan of what I want my life to be. She said, Chris... I just want you to know how much I love you. I want you to do everything on your master plan. And I want you, again, to know how much I love you. And he said, Mom, why do why'd you say that again? You already told me how much you love me. And she said, I just need you to know it. That night, his mother committed suicide. And Chris set out to live through this vision that he had despite all of the trauma he'd experienced. And he succeeded in every aspect. He talks, uh, in a talk just recently that I watched online, he talks about what he would do if he could talk to his mother again. And he said, I know that I'd want to tell her that I completed everything on my master plan, that I got my diploma, I got my college degree, I'm getting another college degree. I've started two businesses in Baltimore City that have given over 290 jobs to former felons, to people who grew up just like me. I'm doing work that's changing the lives of people who grew up just like me. I've traveled all over the world. I've written a book. Um, and I got that black convertible Corvette with really nice rims. He said, I want my mom to know all those things. And then he said, but you know, I wonder if I could talk to her one more time, if it, I would just say, mom, I want you to know I love you too. As we turn to the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Jesus that we've been following for, so, for a, few, a few weeks now, we find that Jesus has finally arrived. He's finally arrived in Bethany where Lazarus is buried. He got the news a long time ago, it seems, that his friend was very sick and he delayed in going. He took his time. He finally started the journey to Bethany. And when he got there, he found that Lazarus had been dead for four years days. Martha, Lazarus' sister, ran out to meet Jesus. She didn't wait for him to get to the house. She ran out to meet him. She didn't say hello. She didn't hug him. She didn't say welcome. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's part of her grieving process. And then she said, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now, it's not really clear what she was asking there. It seems unlikely that she literally wanted Jesus to raise her brother who had been dead for four days, but maybe that was what was on her mind. Jesus responded to her by saying, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, well, yeah, I know that. He will rise on the last day. He will rise at the resurrection on the last day when we will all be judged by God. That's what she was thinking. She was thinking of this common belief in, at that time, as well as a common belief that's been preserved in Scripture, probably more than anything else about the afterlife or the end of time. This is the belief that we hear in Scripture. It's not that we, we die and we go to heaven immediately and we meet St. Peter at the pearly gates, or that even that we're immediately reunited with our loved ones. Those are beautiful images of heaven that many of us hold, including myself. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible describes a last day, a day at the end of time, the day of the Lord, a day of final judgment, a day when all the people who have ever lived will rise to be judged by God. We are a Matthew 25 church, and Matthew 25 describes exactly this scene and exactly this theology. In Matthew 25, it describes all of the nations coming and standing before the Son of Man and being divided into two groups. One group goes into eternal life, and one group goes into the eternal flames. It's a pretty powerful parable. And the people don't know why exactly they've been going in which direction or the other. And Jesus says, because some of you took care of me when I was sick. 
and some of you visited me when I was in prison, and some of you fed me when I was hungry, and others of you did not do those things to me. And everybody's confused, saying, when, when did this happen? When did we see you sick and take care of you? When did we see you hungry and not feed you? And Jesus offers that famous line, whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. That may have been what Martha was imagining, what she had in mind as this resurrection on the last day. We don't know for sure. But whatever she meant when she said, I believe in the resurrection on the last day when we will all rise and be judged by God, Jesus replied to her, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, I don't believe here that what Jesus means is that we have to believe in him with some magic formula. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Therefore, I've said the magic words, and I'm going into eternal life and the resurrection. I believe what Jesus is calling us to here, as he does so often in the Gospel of John, is to not hold the vision of heaven at arm's length to not hold the kingdom of God, the presence of God, what we are called to be at some distant point in the future. Jesus is calling us to pull all that into the present, to have a vision of heaven and what we are called to be, whether it's being reunited with our loved ones or whether it's losing all of our fear and all of our grief and all of our sorrow and all of our anger and just being exactly the children of God that we were created to be, whether it's a vision of heaven that imagines justice flowing down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream where all the people of the earth see each other as equal children of God and treat each other as such. Whatever that vision of heaven is, it's really not important what the details are. What's important is that we are pulling it into the present. That we're imagining what heaven is and bringing it down to earth seeing what our future could be, a vision of God's future for us, and bringing it into our present, imagining it with our minds, and letting it settle into our hearts. I believe that's what Chris Wilson did. I believe he had that vision, but it wasn't just a vision he held at arm's length. It was a vision that came into his present moment. And I believe that's what we are also called to do by Jesus not to say a specific formula, not to have a certain belief, but to hold a vision of what we are called to be, what our world is called to be, a vision of the people that we will see again who have already died, and to not let just that just be a stale screen, screen of some time in the future, but to bring it in to this present moment. Jesus says it very simply, I am the resurrection. Amen.